Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I am your host, Charles Wallace, and welcome to the Bear Essentials Podcast. As we continue on our journey to build a stronger community, I'm very excited to share with you all the Kindness Alliance, which is a unique free of charge advertising initiative looking to support businesses that share in our core values. Each episode will look to spotlight a different member, celebrating their contributions and dedication to kindness. Would you like to get involved? Just visit the Kindness Alliance section on our website, www.thebearessentialspodcast.com, or just send me a message. And now, a huge thank you to this week's Kindness Alliance member. Black Pad Coffee Company. Awesome coffee. Supporting awesome dogs. Go grab some today at their website, www.blackpadcoffee.com. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Charles. Yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to it. So thank you for that. Um, just get started here. Could you give a brief intro of yourself? Yeah, my name is uh, Mike Sorelli, born and raised in the Bay Area. Uh, served 20 years in the uh, the military between the Marine Corps and uh, the Navy, particularly with the uh, the SEAL teams. Uh, we've written two Amazon bestselling books, uh, one on basically leadership and talent. And then uh, another on what I call self leadership, not self help. Uh, I run men's journals, uh, Everyday Warrior Initiative, which at what, one time was uh, their largest initiative. But, uh, we're moving over to uh, to Sports Illustrated uh, with that platform, uh, which is my partner is John Wellborn, who played ten years in the NFL. Um, and then also have a company called Legacy Expeditions, which does these extreme expeditions in honor of our fallen. And uh, also have a studio side of that company uh, with my co-owner, uh, Dan Myrick, best known for the Blair Witch Project, which broke every indie record. And we produce documentaries on those expeditions, really telling the story of the, the, you know, the living uh, and the fallen through their eyes. And it's sort of a combination of Jimmy Chin meets the amazing race with the camaraderie and uh, homecoming and belonging of Band of Brothers. And so we're really proud of that. We just released a documentary that was picked up for theatrical release. It's in theaters now called Triple Seven. They said it couldn't be done. A team of uh, nine special operators uh, set four world records doing a skydiving feat that the world said, or the global community, skydiving community, said it couldn't be done. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Man, that's... It's fantastic stuff. And thanks for sending me the the link uh, for the documentary. Uh, definitely was checking that out and really, really cool stuff. So let me start with this. What what initially motivated you to join the join the military, the Navy SEALs? And then how did that experience shape your views on leadership? Uh, it, that, that's a great question. And, and to be honest, it was probably a bit of Hollywood. Um, which I always say is the, the military's greatest recruiting tool, uh, along with, uh, you know, reading the books from Vietnam about the LERPs and SEALs and Green Marais and Recondos. Um, and, you know, eventually met a Force Recon Marine who had a, a substantial, made a, a substantial impact on my life and helped me uh, enlist in the Marine Corps to become a Recon Marine. And then in terms of leadership, uh, just was speaking with uh, a guy named Ramon Colon Lopez, who was a Air Force PJ, uh, Tier 1 JSOC operator, but ended up being the most senior enlisted uh, member of the United States uh, military. 
And that position is known as the SEAC, the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman and the Joint Chiefs. Uh, and we were talking about leadership and just, you know, the level of leadership that I got to do an understudy uh, throughout my 20 years on is just at a level that I've yet to see in the private sector or even within our federal government. And so you just have these world-class leaders that are defined by faith, relationships, community, character, and integrity, and they do the right thing. We don't always get it right in, in the military. And we've, we've had our, our, you know, it's run by humans. Uh, we've had our missteps. Um, but to watch leaders in some of the most volatile, uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous situations uh, just lead with, uh, you know, stoically lead uh, and, and despite major obstacles, just solve problem after problem and inspire their men to do the, uh, the same and to clear the path for us to be successful. Um, there has been a degradation of leadership uh, since World War II. Even um, Ray Dalio and um, I'm thinking of the former Secretary of State, and it will come to me, he recently passed. Uh, they recently did a podcast about a year and a half ago. And in it, uh, the former Secretary of State said that, you know, we were the world's economic superpower post-World War II, and there's no way we could have maintained that. No theor theoretical way that we could possibly maintain it. We're still an economic superpower, but not the economic superpower. There's, there's multiple competitors. But he said it was absolutely possible to maintain the title of uh, the leaders uh, of the free world, and that's degraded. It's degraded in the military to a degree. We still have a higher bar than, than the private sector in, in mainstream society. Um, but it is, there's been a total degradation within the private sector and federal government. And uh, this is what I do for a living. Uh, I don't preach from a pulpit. I love to talk about leadership, culture, and high-performing teams, uh, both organizational performance and individual performance, um, and try to make an impact where I can. Um, but leadership is, is definitely, I'm a student of leadership, culture, and high performance teams. You said something interesting there about the deg degradation of leadership since World War II. My, my question there is, as you say it, I think about it like this. Would you say that that leadership declining, because I think we've seen a little bit of society in general declining. Does the leadership that decline first that cause the society to degrade, or is it vice versa? So you, you know you could you could slice this question question up in a number of ways. Um, you know the military has always been more progressive than mainstream society. We, we desegregated the force. You know the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, you know uh, black infantry units that you know eventually were were integrated with uh, with whites well before mainstream society. Um, so, you know, you see a lot of these societal experiments, particularly with this administration, we're going to stay away from politics, trying to enact things or uh, force these, these societal experiments on the military. And the military is just a completely different culture from mainstream society. It has to be. Uh, lives are on the line. America lives in this, this little bubble. Uh, that's, that's the reality of it. I think world travel, especially to very austere third world countries, war-torn countries, gives you a perspective that, quite frankly, 99% of Americans don't have. Um, so going, what I will go back to is the degradation of values and the attack on values and, and Judeo-Christian values. Um, you know, we have, we have, we, America's new mantra is, when in doubt, lower the bar. When in doubt, lower the bar. So, you know, COVID, you, you saw in Oregon uh, that, you know, uh, they enacted something during COVID that you don't have to pass your class to graduate. I, what, what logic is that steeped in? Um, so our values have degraded massively, and we're trying to maintain those in the military culture as much as possible. And that's why now 75% of young kids are not even eligible to enter the military. You even look at physical education, physical education in the 60s, 70s, even when I was in uh, uh, grammar school in the 80s uh, and early 90s. I remember PE being challenging every single day. 
So it goes back to the whole person concept of a sound mind in a sound body, which uh, a professor at Harvard back in the, uh, the early 1900s, uh, Dudley Sargent, advocated for, particularly the, the, the implementation of physical education within our, our school systems. And you see obesity rates uh, going up, uh, rising rapidly. Uh, it's just a total, total loss of that whole person concept and, and a total just lowering of, of standards where everyone gets a trophy that, you know, equality, which is the biggest BS in the world, it, it, there is no equality in life. Capitalism is, is not based off quality. Um, the, the, the practice of fairness is flawed in a sense. No, no, no two people start out in the same starting block. They're, they're staggered. And that's just life. You know, I entered the Marine Corps as a private uh, alongside every single one uh, of the Marine candidates, the 250 Marine candidates. And that is the only place that I, I, I truly found that we were all equally worthless, as they say. And, you know, you saw of those 250 Marines, those that excelled, those that lacked uh, character, and those who excelled within their career. And ult ultimately, the military is a very merit-based system. Um, so, yeah, to, to, to come around, it's, it's just we have, we've gotten away from our values um, and the, 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 the victimhood mentality is the true pandemic that is, is, is just totally overcoming COVID. And, and I'm not downplaying COVID. Uh, too many lives were lost. That was tragic. But it seems like, you know, everyone wants to fall into this victim good category because it's so easy. And everyone's telling everyone, you know, because someone else has so much, you have so little, and it's not your fault, it's their fault. Um, and that is just totally counter to what I've learned in the military culture of if you want it, you've got to put the work in. You've got to push beyond what you, you think you're, 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 you're possible or what you're capable of. And you've got to prove that you're worthy of the next rank or the next position. And that's how it's earned. And um, I miss that a lot. I miss that a lot, actually. Um, but I've, I've taken those skills that I learned in the military. I'm starting some very successful companies, one of which is getting acquired. My, my true baby talent work group, which is a leadership development and executive search firm. And we're finalizing the terms on that. But um, what I learned in the military, the leadership principles, the characteristics, the attributes have all proven successful uh, paired with a lot of hard work have proven successful in the private sector. Great segue, Mike. I Listen, I, I could go on about that last segment for even longer, but in the interest of time, and I want to get to some more stuff with you, let's move on great segue to the talent the talent war um you mentioned about talent so how how in general can it does go back a little bit to what you said because i don't think it's unfortunate that talent is sometimes matters enough anymore right there's so many other reasons why you can get a job or whatever not based on your talent but how do businesses in, in this day and age how do you help them adopt these principles to make sure they're getting the correct talent? So the, the, the book, The Talent War, you know, Special Operations and Great Organizations, one on talent, that was far more successful than we, we imagined. And it's got like this almost, I don't want to say cult-like following, but uh, we get strange emails from across the world, uh, you know, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Italy, France, that people have read our book and, and, and want us to come out and, and work with them. But, you know, within that, um, it was a research-based book, took about three years in all to write great interviews. We were very selective about the interviews we conducted from Tracy Keogh, uh, the highest paid CHRO in the world, just a total lion. Uh, and she was the CHRO of HP who actually convinced the board to take Meg Whitman, which was a highly successful, she was a highly successful CEO uh, of HP to General Jerry Boykin, uh, one of the early founding members of Delta Force involved in Operation Eagle Claw who then was in charge of the entire, entire United States Army Special Operations Command uh, and made some pivotal calls. Uh, like early in the, the global war on, on terror, he, he helped shape the, X, the 18 X-ray program where kids straight out of high school and college, if they, if they met all the requirements, could immediately try out for special forces. 
uh, versus the past, um, where they had to do you know two to four years of army regular conventional army time to 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 submit an application. That program has been wildly successful, and it's a perfect example. We're not saying that experience doesn't matter, but from the research we conducted, experience is not necessarily predictive of future performance. And when people use the word experience, you usually use it with a good connotation from a psychological uh, aspect of, oh, this person has 10 years of experience, so they must be good to go. But it's actually more nuanced than that. You look back at, okay, that's 10, there are plenty of SEALs that when I came in had 10 years of experience and I had, uh, well, I was a prior recon Marine, but I had zero years of experience as a SEAL. And they were awful. They were God awful. And what we're going is that show me their mentors, show me their past performance. But I mean, it's key, their mentors. If they studied under just a world-class leader, then yes, that experience probably matters if they, they adopted a lot of those principles. But if they studied under a substandard leader, they most likely uh, have horrible habits, horrible routines. They're not disciplined or accountable. And their bar is extremely low. So it goes back to the old humble, hungry, smart uh, quote, hire humble, hungry, and smart. People that are not entitled because they're graduating from an Ivy League school, uh, we're not saying intellectual horsepower. Amongst all our interviews, they said intellectual horsepower matters. But actually, not IQ, but effective intelligence. That's the ability to use what intelligence you have to solve real world problems for which no book solutions exist. And again, I go back to my time as in the SEALs. The SEALs used to be fascinated with guys coming out of the Ivy League schools. But they actually made very statistically, or I'd say per capita, made very bad field uh, battlefield commanders. Is they were suffer from paralysis through analysis. They couldn't simplify uh, you know, things down to just the, the, the base route and make a, a quick decision based off 60% of, uh, of the site picture or the intelligence uh, that we, we had. And guys from the University of Iowa that you know barely graduated with a 3.25 uh, made outstanding uh, battlefield commanders and great leaders in the SEAL teams because they had, were high in situational awareness. So ultimately, where it comes down to is don't hire based off experience or pedigree, but understand the attributes for each specific role that you're looking for, which is, you know, you take an engineer, the attributes that make a great engineer are wildly different than the attributes that make a, a, a great sales leader or a salesperson. And so, but you have to know what you're looking for. If you don't know what you're looking for in terms of talent coming in, uh, my co-author George Randall said, it's, it's synonymous to going to the, the grocery store um, hungry and you end up uh, purchasing everything in the middle aisles, which is all processed foods and none of it is good for you. But if you go with the plan, you go with the list, you know what you're looking for, you stay on those outside aisles with all the whole foods. And, and it's the same thing. Very few organizations that we have found have a systematic hiring process that they stick to that actually turns out predictive uh, uh, data, data that they can then take from good hires and bad hires. Because you know some people just interview extremely well, they they talk well, they fool you, they get in, you realize they have no work ethic. But similar to what the SEALs and especially the Army Special Forces community was well ahead of every other community in codifying what they were looking for and how to assess it. But that process that they get back is, yeah, this person did very well in the assessment and selection phase of special forces assessment and selection, but turned out to be a, a, just a, a subpar Green Beret or Army Special Forces soldier. And they'll look at that and then evolve the process. But very few companies have uh, a systematic process that produces data from which you can evolve. It's Fascinating stuff because I've been in obviously I've been in the corporate world now since I graduated high school as far as healthcare data analytics since I was like 17. And as I listen to you talk about that, I can't sit here and say that I can really think that that's the way it's been done. I, I don't think it is done that way. Um, how how does that translate in this day and age, right, between the talent and leadership with this? now our reality, I call it our virtual reality, right? With all this work from home and things like that. Do you find that when you're talking to companies, has that become a problem? How do you work around that? So I wrote an article and released it and said up front, I mean, I, I said, let me set the record straight in this article. I am not a fan of remote work. Not at all. The talent market, remember, we wrote this book before COVID, though it's, it, it, you know, going through the manuscript process, it came out 
uh, sort of smack dab during COVID. We, we've seen the great resignation. Then the people didn't work for a while and they recognized that they had no income. And then there was the great regret. And then also concepts of quiet quitting. What is the bare minimum I can do and have no engagement with other employees, but maintain my job and my income coming in paired with remote work. It is the most interesting talent market, which I could say the most difficult talent market that we've seen in generations. And, you know, God bless, this is my personal opinion only, God bless, uh, you know, CEOs like Jeff Jassy uh, of Amazon who revoked the the remote work policy. And of course, all the employees were up in an uproar of this is, this is BS. And he said, I understand, but uh, come Monday morning, you better be in the office or uh, look for another job. Um, even the Nike CEO recently came out and said, we've seen such a rapid decline in employee engagement and innovation within Nike with this remote work policy. You can't build teams in a remote environment. And if that, uh, if that upsets you, what I'm saying, that's probably a you problem. And you're trying to hold on to working at home. Now, I came from a world where I'd be communicating from Afghanistan with a command that's sitting on the East Coast of the United States. But we had a common thread amongst us. And usually we knew each other and had been through hard things together, developed sh uh, shared adversity, which develops uh, you know, homecoming belonging, uh, it allows vulnerability, which ultimately are the, you know, those three are the byproduct of the, 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 the one thing that matters in the workplace and that's trust. So it's a different environment, but uh, there was, and I'll leave it, leave you with this. Uh, we, we, we try to help companies as best as possible, possible. the employee engagement in a remote environment and, and the concept of quiet sitting are our primary concerns. How do you keep a, a workforce that is remote engaged as much as possible? What are those innovative things you could do to build relationships through, through a virtual environment? Uh, what are those, uh, let's call it performance uh, sort of metrics that you, performance management metrics that you can place to make sure that you're holding people accountable since you're not watching them uh, conduct work and that they're actually performing. Um, but there was an operation in uh, 1981 uh, called Operation Eagle Claw. It was the failed hostage rescue attempt of the 52 Americans that were in Tehran after the Islamic uprising in, in 1979. So uh, this was Delta Force's first operation, uh, and it was a, a, a textbook failure, but not by 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 anything that Delta did, a two aircraft collided in the deserts outside of Tehran and eight Americans were killed. And it also became a watershed moment in special operations from which SOCOM, the United, special, United States Special Operations Command and the Joint Special Operations Command, that's what gave birth to those, is this incident. Uh, and they actually, there was, there was a high degree of accountability and there was actually congressional hearings and the founder of Delta Force, a, a just, just tough soldier named Charlie Beckwith, Silver Star recipient from Vietnam, had spent time with the British SAS, uh, testified and said, uh, he, he basically diagnosed what the, the problem was, is they threw units that had never worked together, uh, together last minute to conduct this operation. And no surprise, things went wrong. And he said, Bear Bryant, the old coach of Alabama, can't build a national championship football team with his quarterback in Alabama, his front line in Texas, and his defense in Oklahoma. And, and I've, I've, I've sort of taken liberties there. What he's saying is that there has to be physical contact, uh, physical engagement uh, amongst uh, people within any organization in order to build those relationships, homecoming, belonging, vulnerability, and trust. And so this is a challenge as business leaders it's not going away. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, it, this, this was around before COVID. People were in remote environments because somebody has an essential set of skills that's in Ireland and, and is doing work for you. And, and that's fine. But you've got to be in a way innovative in, in ways to build those relationships and keep them engaged and feel and, and keep them feeling like uh, they're part of the team as well as holding them accountability, accountable. But I, one of the, the primary subjects I talk about when I, I speak to companies, and this is what I do for a living keynote spe speeches, is accountability. 
if you don't have a culture defined by account- accountability, I'm not saying you don't have a culture. I'm saying you don't have a culture that's worth a damn. At the end of the day, the highest form of compassion and love and the mechanism through which we help the younger generation learn as well as ourselves is accountability. And it's not meant to be this external form of punishment. You've got to reframe it. But accountability uh, to standards, accountability to outcomes is wildly important. If not, you you don't have an effective culture. That word accountability, how much of that do you think is taught and how much do you think is just it's inherent by each individual? It depends on the organization. Some organizations in the private sector do it very well. But um, I'll tell you within special operations, I didn't need others to hold me accountable. We, we have a process called an after action review. I, rec- I call it the art of the debrief because it's an art. And it was one of the most effective tools, cost free, other than time, to both individual and organizational evolution and development. We diagnosed everything we did and said, what was planned? What went according to plan? What did we do well? But more importantly, what did we do poorly and need to fix moving forward? And you would see guys come forward and admit their mistakes, partly out of fear of somebody else calling them out probably, but uh, they would they would come forward and say, hey, I screwed this up. I want you guys to know this is the problem I faced. This was my train of thought. These are the actions I took. It didn't work out in my favor. What would you guys have done differently? Or they say, hey, here's what I would have done uh, differently given the outcomes. But um, I mean, even with my commanding officers, my CEOs, you know, they would, you know, when I sat down with them and they gave me an onboarding brief when they took command or I came into their command, they'd give me their expectations. And at the very end, what they wouldn't expect is I said, hey, sir, are you done? I, I understand everything you're saying. And they'd say, yes. And they didn't expect what was coming. They said, hey, uh, I actually have some requirements as well, is that you hold me accountable. If you see me do something wrong, I may not realize that I'm doing something wrong. So grab me and in a professional tactical way. Uh, and usually it was through the scrapping math- method. Hey, Mike, why did you approach that problem set like that? What were you thinking and how did it end up? And they helped me learn. But I always ask my leaders, hold me accountable because I may not recognize that I'm doing something wrong. In my, I, like, I wanted to be the very best leader for my men and women. And so having great coaches and mentors to, to again, through the Socratic method with professionals and intact, pull me aside and say, hey, young buck, you could have done that better. Let's have a conversation about it. And there was coaching, mentorship, uh, and development that went on. Yeah, that, um, I think, again, as you're saying, and I'm picturing my own, career my own experiences and it's definitely it it's interesting to me and i don't think there is enough of it and i think i'm always running into is it more about people not wanting to be held accountable not enough people who want to be held accountable and i think we get to this kind of double-edged sword where you know you get a lot of people that do like you said they they're they're hard drivers they want to be held accountable but then there's others that any type of just criticism constructive or not they just shut down and that becomes how do you handle that so when i say you have to beat it out of them yeah i'm not talking about physical abuse we we don't put our hands on our guys and uh it, that's the the old drafty uh military you, you have to sort of give them a come to jesus speech and tell them if, if they cannot take criticism, they cannot evolve, and you are not going to be part of this organization, bottom line. Um, and, you know, the lack of accountability, and I'll tell you a good story here. The lack of accountability has become this almost systemic problem within our nation. It, 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 and not to call out, again, the, the administration, but with the withdrawal of Afghanistan, uh, you have saw a total lack of accountability. Nothing has been done about it, both from our military generals as well as especially the, 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 the commander-in-chief, the leader of the free world. And at some point you said, hey, the buck stops with me. But actually, the previous administration signed the Doha Agreement. It's not my fault. Um, so it's become very easy to point fingers and cast blame on other people. Well, this failed not because of me, but because of them. And you have to understand the greatest form of leadership development is leading by example. And we're seeing very little of that, especially within our national, our national leaders in the national capital region. It, it's, it's horrific. 
And this is what the younger generation sees. So now it's become socially acceptable to blame other people for your, your, your failures. Um, behavioral modeling and observational learning, leading by example, are, are one of the highest forms of leadership development. If you're as a leader, people are watching. They're watching you to see if your words align with your actions. And if they don't, it's rules for thee, not for me, or rules for thee, not for me. Um, so we've had a few generations, not generations, but decades of this uh, systemic, you know, uh, you know, deflection of, of blame and accountability that is getting worse as we move forward. And um, again, it's an attack on the values uh, that, that sort of were the foundation of our, of our country. Um, and it's, it's concerning. It's, it's, it's very concerning. And I mean, this is why I go on Fox News occasionally, I'm not saying that Fox is perfect. Uh, they're a pretty damn good network, given all the other networks I go on uh, and talk about society and culture. It, it's sort of these, these red flags that, that are appearing. Um, our leaders need to be steeped in, in, in faith, character, integrity. Uh, they have to be, and they have to set the example for communal sacrifice, not only within their companies, but within their communities, and we're seeing a total lack of that. The, the American culture is defined by me, 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 me. Whereas in the military, the reason the culture is different, and we need to protect that from, from normal society, and we're not throwing shade towards mainstream society. Um, if you can't put we before me, then you are not going to do very well in, uh, in that, within that culture. But that culture should exist within companies. You know, the, the reason selflessness is so important is to put your needs aside for what's good for the organization, understanding that when the organization wins, everyone within the organization wins as well. And we're not seeing a lot of that, even within the tech space. People jumping, I think the, the average tenure within a tech company, I, the last data I saw was like 1.25 years because they jumped to another tech company that's willing to pay them more. Well, what does it say about the culture of the company they're leaving? Because a lot of people pass up and won't leave great cultures just for a simple $10,000, $25,000 pay raise. They're like, nope, I, I love where I'm at. I love the leadership. I love the culture. I love the people I'm surrounded with. But very, very concerning um, signs right now. And I will say, you know, uh, that same gentleman I, I referenced, that was the SEAC. He and I have a children's series coming out starting either late June or early July. Uh, the date hasn't been set yet. But the children's series is called the One Step at a Time series. And we're going to turn out a new volume every probably eight to 12 months. And it's meant to be a children's leadership development series with a cute story, reinforcing three leadership attributes or principles or characteristics that children need to understand to become kind, empathetic, respectful human beings who contribute to society who understand communal sacrifice and more importantly, have the ability to stand on their own two feet, fall, get back up, learn, and then pass it on to the next generation. And so at the end of the book, they have guided discussions for parents and teachers and the children uh, and, and other exercises like goal setting uh, and with reverse planning to, to, to supplement the lack of leadership development and character building that we see within our general school systems. Listen, when that comes out, could you please let me know so I can help you promote that? And selfishly, uh, the first one is named after I've got a little girl on the way. Oh, uh, her, name, her, name, her name is going to be Scarlett Antoinette Sorelli. So it's Scarlett's big shot turning setback into success. And it's about basketball in this one. Not that uh, he or I are, are good basketball players by any means, but um, it's cute. It's fun. I think it, it helps parents uh, mentor, and we all know that that families are are they set the foundation for uh, for children, and then if you join the military, they chip away at it and refine it. Yeah, and I think it goes back to what you started with: as society and leadership is degrading, I think that's a way to start to stem that tide and start to bring it bring it back on an uptick. So that's really really great stuff. Um, listen, I'll say this to you: I've done this now for three years, and I think I've 
learned as much or more in this short period of time than I have with anyone. Um, but I wanted to end with and you talking a little bit about the documentary. Uh, I didn't want to miss that. So could you get into that a little bit, Mike, to close here? Yeah, absolutely. So Legacy Expeditions is this company I founded, Expeditions in Honor of Our Fallen. Uh, I was, this is post-retirement, sitting on the couch. I had had a hip replacement in my left hip. Um, and it was a different type of hip replacement, which was a little more intrusive. So the recovery period was longer. And I knew that I missed the general, I, you know, we, we belong to a tribe in the military. It's the greatest support mechanism there is. I missed that. I missed the caliber of the men and women that, that I was used to being around. I missed adventure. And one thing we understand within special operations and the military as a whole is we, we, we say we do hard things. We seek challenge for one reason. When you push yourself out your, outside your physical and mental comfort zones, that is where true character emerges. Subsequently, that is also where true learning and growth take place. And so you have to continually rise the bar. What's the high, you know, you reach a peak. Okay, what's the next higher peak? Peak and going for that is constantly raising the bar. So the first expedition we did was we went and skydived into Mount Everest, not onto Everest, but into into base camp, which are the highest drop zones in the world, which has a complete set of uh, of, of problems and uh, complications that that have to be uh, sort of figured out through extensive planning. And so we we pulled that one off recently. Uh, and this this has been a three year project. There's been this feat within the global skydiving community that multiple people have tried to accomplish and all have failed, called the triple seven or seven seven seven. Seven continents, seven skydives, seven days. And like I said, it's been around since like the seventies. And I contacted some buddies and I said, okay, hey, let's put a team together. Let's give this a shot. And everyone, there's a guy named Andy Stump, uh, who, who's a good good friend. He was automatically within the first like minute of me talking about it. He's like, I'm in. Other guy who actually was in the skydiving industry was really resistant, negative. And he's like, oh, you're asking a lot of people. And no, we can't do this. The, you know, multiple people have tried. And eventually we, we convinced him and, and brought in other guys. But it took 18 months of planning. What this was is it was less about the risk of the jumps. And the jumps were cool. I mean, we jumped in Antarctica. We jumped over the pyramids of Giza and Egypt. Um, it was a logistical challenge that nobody had been able to figure out. Multiple people had tried this with private jets. In fact, a group tried a month after we actually did it in January 2023 and set the four world records, and they couldn't even get into Antarctica. And when we heard their plan two months before they were, they were, they were going to launch, we knew they were going to fail because they had failed. It, when, you, when you fail to plan, plan to fail. And their planning was not uh, diligent. It was not nuanced. And that's what I learned very well from the Joint Special Operations Command in my time there, the Tier 1 Fortress. The 18 months of planning, assessing flight routes, uh, the, the sort of uh, efficiency rate of, of different airports, of different airlines, um, putting together operations and logistics. This was a logistic challenge and a testament to the fact that we're problem solvers. So after 18 months, we, we embarked, we ended up doing it, starting in Antarctica, uh, finishing in Perth, Australia. We did it in six days, six hours, and six minutes. Commercial air. We didn't even have a private jet. Um, and we ran into some major challenges, which are in the documentary that they, I, might, I consider those nine guys my brain trust. A lot, they were all pretty much smarter than me. But that's the beauty of leadership. When you have a team, they are your brain trust. Uh, their aggregate intelligence and, and their aggregate experience can solve any problem quicker and faster than you can. So you have to learn to tap into that and also foster it and push it. Um, so we set four world records, but more importantly, we jumped in honor of a fallen service member on each continent. And that story was told by one of the jumpers. Um, and we also raised $2 million for Folds of Honor, which is a great organization that gives educational scholarships to spouses and children of fallen and disabled service members educate the legacy they left behind. It was a natural pairing and they're continuing to raise funds. The documentary was filmed and directed by Dan Myrick, again, the Blair Witch guy who set every indie record, uh, filmed the Blair Witch for 30,000 and it grossed 240 million at the box office. And so that's why he holds every indie record. 
Uh, and we recently just completed five red carpet screeners. It's in select theaters across the nation now. And people can find those theaters at LegacyExpeditions.com. But, uh, you know, I was very nervous to go to these screeners. One, it, it just feels cringy to watch yourself on, on screen. So I didn't watch any of the screeners except for one because my wife was in the audience. She'd never seen it. Um, so we went outside. We opened up, let them watch a movie, went outside. The testimonials, which is my biggest concern. Hey, what does the world think? Um, the testimonials were, were heartfelt tears people said they cried they laughed and the most common thing is they've never seen soldiers humanized in such a way and of the impact that service had on them to become the men that they are and the women that they are but also the impacts on the family and the impacts of the families of the fallen and so it's that combination of jimmy chin meets uh, amazing race with the camaraderie of uh, band of brothers and my only hope is that we can secure a deal with a uh, production studio because these, these were not cheap. And I've, I've bet the farm on this um, to put different veterans in front of the, the cameras for different challenges because there's a lot of stories to be told. And it is, you know, I'd say as a, a secondary mission of mine is to educate the younger generation of the outcomes of service in the military and who you become. And how that's an amazing thing because each of the guys on the uh, expedition have all started companies, all have like 10 combat deployments under the belt, which is high for, for veterans in the global war on terror. Um, but there's a lot of stories to be told and also indirectly show the American public what true communal sacrifice and leadership looks like. And I, I, I'm, call me skewed. I'm, 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 I am the biggest advocate for the men and women I served with. I served with lions who were willing to give their lives for that one thing, you and I, but just displayed, you know, selflessness, selfless valor, uh, character and integrity on a nightly basis. And I, I had the fortunate pe pleasure of being on the sidelines very close to them, watching them uh, do these things night after night. It's fantastic stuff, Mike. Um, I'm looking forward to, is it in, is it released in all theaters at this point or is it select? It's it's select, and that's why if you go to legacyexpeditions.com, you can find uh, where it's playing. Okay. Uh, we're the we're the small guys. This mm -hmm. is an independent film. Uh, we do have some conversations with main streaming services uh, going on, and uh, hopefully within you know four to six months, it's on a streaming platform for the world to uh, well America uh, to watch. But it is very pro uh, patriotic uh, and and very apolitical. You know, veterans. The one thing that both Democrats and Republicans, uh, one first thing they need to understand is Republicans don't have the monopoly on patriotism and Democrats don't have the monopoly on democracy. And veterans are an apolitical issue that both sides can get behind. And, and we don't want politics involved with that. Our military service and the 1.3 million men and women that have given their lives to secure our freedom, which does come at a cost, that, that's an issue that all Americans can get behind. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, last question I'm going to ask you here is this. Knowing now that you mentioned you have a child on the way, trying not to be political, elevator pitch, what do you say to the younger generation as we start to think about where our country is, an upcoming election, and where we need to get to? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my generation has failed you so much to set the example for you to emulate. Um, and it's up to you guys. The, the next generation is always the best generation. So we need you to be students of history. We need you to be highly educated. We need you to be just exemplary leaders that understand that you have to sacrifice to some degree for your communities and your nation. And seek challenge. Constantly push yourself, try new things and fail because failure is not an indictment of your character or your worth as a human. It's the mechanism through which you learn. And we need you guys getting outside, sometimes putting those phones down, trying everything to see where your passions lie. And once you find where your passion lies, pour all into it. Leave nothing to chance, no regret, regrets, but be better than our generation and set the example and teach the generation coming behind you to be better than you. Because you may be 16 right now, but before you know it, 
you'll be 40. And I know that's hard for any 16 year old. It's like, no, that person's old. Yeah. I thought the same thing, but um, we're going to do what we can. The few, we're, you know, the minority has always carried this country. You, you look at the, uh, the, the American revolution. Uh, only 40% of colonists supported the war against King George for independence. Only 10, or I'm sorry, 20% fought the civil war. So it only takes the power of a, of a few to impact the many. And so there's a few of us within our generation who are trying. We want to make sure that you grew up with peace and prosperity and you can walk these, these, these streets uh, safely. And uh, that's what I would say. Man, what a great way to end it. And I would be, I want to end it with this. I don't think your generation has failed in any way. And I thank you all for all the service. Um, I It's really appreciate it. And I, I enjoy trying to be somewhat of a small platform here to allow you guys to come and, and speak. Uh, I My grandfather served in World War II and I take that one of my heroes and you guys all, I think the world of you guys. So Mike, thank you so much. Best of luck with everything. The new baby, especially you're not going to get much sleep. Um, hopefully you have time to make a new movie, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll yeah. Listen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. And, um, you know, learning is a two way street and you, and some of the things you've said have resonated. Well, Mike, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. I'll make sure to have show notes and everything. Hopefully get that movie seen by by many. And everybody for watching, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, take a look at Mike and see what he's got going on. It, it's definitely worthwhile. Mike, thanks again. Thanks, Charles. Bye. This has been The Bare Essentials. Thanks for listening. And remember, never hibernate on your goals.